Hello. My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's program on behalf of the Sousa Mendes Foundation. Thank you for spending an hour of your Valentine's Day with us. We're going to be talking about one of the great love stories of history, when love saved Jewish Holocaust uh, persecution victims in mortal danger. And we're going to he hear uh, the history of this, uh, this story, and we're going to hear a personal family uh, story and uh, we have just the right speakers to share this history with us today. So starting us off will be my friend and colleague, Dr. Mordechai Paldiel. And he's on the board of the Susan Mendes Foundation, but he's also on the board of another foundation called the Ro Rosenstrasse Foundation, which he co-founded with Dr. Nathan Stoltzfus, who is also on our panel today. So Dr. Paldiel will uh, introduce a little bit of a film clip and then he will introduce our first speaker. So Mordechai, hello. Hello everyone. <clears throat> Today's program is devoted to an unprecedented event in Nazi Germany at the height of the Holocaust, of a large group of women publicly protesting for over a week in the heart of Berlin for the release of their Jewish husbands, and amazingly succeeding in forcing Hitler and Goebbels to concede to their demands. An event still debated today by historians on the causes and the decision to liberate the Jewish husbands, even, even some who had already been sent to Auschwitz and they had to be sent back. Here is a clip of a 2003 German film that reenacted that event. Guck mal. wieder haben. Ich will meinen Mann 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 wieder haben. Wir wollen unsere Männer wieder haben. Ich will meinen Mann wieder haben. Wir wollen unsere Männer wieder haben. I would introduce Nathan Stolzfus, a colleague and a friend. 
is professor of Holocaust studies at Florida State University. His 1996 book, Resistance of the Heart, is the first pioneer study of the Rosenstrasse protest in Nazi Germany and won numerous prestigious awards. He is the author of other books and is co-author with me and Judy Baumann Schwartz of Women Defying Hitler that is due to appear in a few months. Nathan, you're on. I'm absolutely delighted, Mordecai, that you introduced me. Thank you. I'm happy to be part of these Sunday programs with uh, Susan Mendez uh, Foundation. Matt, can you uh, give me slide one, please? Okay, so 98% of full German Jews, that's according to the Nuremberg Law definition, full German Jews who survived, 98% were living in intermarriage when, the, uh, when Hitler fell. Now, the question is, how is it that 98% lived in intermarriage? And the answer is the Rosenstrasse protest. That protest at least starkly reveals the dam that these couples had erected uh, between themselves and the Gestapo to save their Jewish partners. Next slide. Now, the dam that these uh, intermarried couples built between themselves and the Gestapo was not overnight. It was uh, constructed over 10 terrifying years, starting with the first days of Hitler in 1933 in April, already weeks within Hitler's uh, arrival in power. Jews were expelled from their jobs by the uh, Aryan Clause. Eventually, even some non-Jews were expelled from their work uh, because they were married to Jews. Now, this was not only uh, an experience that these intermarried couples uh, experienced at work. In fact, Victor Klemper's famous diary, I Will Bear Witness, illustrates their almost immediate social death, how friends evaporated, people who were close at work or home in the neighborhood suddenly uh, disappeared. This uh, staggering one-two punch of Gestapo and society working together uh, was, uh, was, was a staggering blow. Day by day, the grinding uncertainty about what would happen to them. The only ground they had to stand on was themselves together if they could only hold. Slide next. These couples, uh, three I uh, put up here, highlight some daily struggles. On the left-hand side, you see uh, Charlotte and Julius Israel from her scrapbook. She chose to show the food rations of, uh, that, that were given to Jews. They were just like the ones who were uh, not given to Jews. It's just that the food rations for Jews had a big J over them so that uh, they were uh, not uh, good. And uh, uh, she thought, you know, it was a kind of humiliation. The famous Klemper is there at the bottom with uh, Victor and Ava, his wife. What's uh, to say about that? Ava moved with Victor into a Jewish house in Dresden in 1939. Uh, the Nazis were counting on these couples dissolving. They didn't declare that they were dissolved. They certainly considered it but they uh, eventually decided not to because of the, uh, they didn't think it would solve the problem. They wanted the non-Jewish partner to leave the Jewish partner and just declaring them divorced would not, would not do that. So they didn't. Uh, another thing that's notable about the Klemper is he records in his diaries that he asked that when, she, when he was picked up and taken off to the East that she would not go with him, at least she could survive and she refused. Now at the top, we have uh, the Grodkas. Uh, they have notable stories. One of them that is most touching uh, is that the, uh, their, their, their daughter that they, they had uh, born in 1940 died very shortly after birth and their neighbors actually had a kind of celebration dancing around uh, celebrating that the Jewish spawn had, been, uh, had died. Next slide. Now this I put up just to show the rareness, the importance uh, of these few who non-conformed. Heydrich, the executor of the final solution says, the 
the German population forces the Jew to behave himself. The control of the Jew through the watchful eye of the whole population is better than having him by the thousands in a ghetto where I cannot properly establish control over his daily life. So Heydrich is saying, I don't need uniformed agents. All I need is the Jews informing and I mean the non-Jews informing and denouncing on the Jews. Uh, and uh, so we have the uh, massive 99% of the German population bystanding or going along dancing in Hitler's direction. And we have these few several 10,000, 30,000 intermarried couples who are dancing in the opposite direction, learning how to, uh, learning how to resist, learning how to non-conform, building up their courage and capacity, building up the dam, their willingness to go against the fear. It's not that they had no fear, they simply worked with that to protect their Jews from uh, their Jewish partners from my annihilation. Next slide. So Goebbels planned to deport every person wearing the star in Berlin. He had been asking Hitler about this uh, on December the 8th, 1942, Hitler finally agrees that all non-privileged Jews will be deported. That means all persons wearing the yellow star. Uh, there were some privileged who did not wear the star. Uh, and so uh, a couple months later, middle of February, uh, you see the uh, entry from his diary here. Goebbels says, I have put myself to the task to make Berlin entirely free of Jews by the middle or end of March at the latest. So uh, that's all set. Now, another important aspect here is that in addition to Goebbels' push as the Gauleiter to clean Berlin of all Jews, as he would put it, uh, is the call from Auschwitz for skilled Berlin Jewish laborers. Auschwitz, Birkenau and I was expecting 15,000 skilled Jewish workers from Berlin, that's a number that could never have been met. Even two thirds of that number couldn't have been met without including intermarried Jews. So there's a push and a pull here for the uh, deportation of these intermarried Jews. Next slide. So Elsa Holzer and Rudy Holzer, uh, <clears throat> I just put this here because she said she went to the protest as an act from the heart. She said if the women had gotten together and decided, what can we do? What should we do? They would never have protested because that wouldn't have seemed likely to be a winning strategy, but they acted from the heart and look what happened when it came to standing up and withstanding the threats of being shot by the Gestapo and the SS, they were able to be there. She said, take the first step and you'll see what happens. Next slide. The protest erupted after uh, the Gestapo's uh, final roundup of the capital city's Jews, the so-called factory action or fabric action. Uh, the wives began to arrive that same evening of the protest to, uh, they wanted to show their loyalty. They wanted to show their husbands that not everyone had abandoned them. That was what was going on. And this was, uh, what El El uh, uh, Elsa Holzer called the silk thread, hanging over Auschwitz with a silk thread of this connection to uh, their marriage. Wives arrived that evening on February 27th, the first day of this arrest, and some agreed to meet the next morning and make a scene. And uh, that was Charlotte Israel told me that. The next morning, as Annie Ratlauer testified to the court, when she arrived early the next morning on February the 28th as she got closer and closer to the Rosenstrasse as she heard louder and louder this call out from the women, give us our husbands back. And uh, this protest wasn't just a small thing. It went on for, for a whole week. It went on days. Some people were there at night. Of course, not the same people. Some came and some left. And during the course of this, there was uh, threats from the Gestapo, clear the streets or we'll shoot. Clear the streets or we'll shoot. It, sc it, it scattered the women, it sent them dashing into the doorways. Uh, but when within a couple hours, they regrouped and uh, soon resumed their protest. So the courage and capacity did not break and the dam held against the Gestapo 
Next slide. No, so uh, Goebbels records in his diary, I will commission the security police not to continue the Jewish evacuations during such a critical time. Other sources at the time also connected the protest with the release. Now, this was, of course, not an act of compassion. It was just a cold calculation, a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and that became clear when uh, three days later, uh, after writing this, Goebbels met with Hitler for his confirmation of the release. Hitler accepted Goebbels' uh, release of the intermarried Jews due to what uh, Goebbels identifies as a psychological cost of war. Psychological cost of war. Over 10 years, the regime had gotten to know who these wives were, and they knew that there was no separating them without getting, without having a big scene calling attention to the fact that intermarried couples still existed and to the final solution, the Holocaust as a whole. So uh, the regime was very clear that it had to keep the line directly uh, dividing Jews and non-Jews in terms of who was being deported to the East. They didn't want to include these non-Jewish partners. Now in the East, they did include them if they didn't divorce, but here, in the Reich, it was important, Hitler's image was important uh, to, uh, to unite all the Germans with, against, uh, in the war effort. Next slide, please. So here we have the US uh, American Office of Strategic Services telegram. That's the predecessor to the uh, CIA uh, intelligence during World War II uh, from Bern reported on April the 1st that actions against Jewish wives and husbands on the part of the Gestapo had to be discontinued some time ago because of the protest which such action aroused. Next slide. Here we have a lovely poem I found in Yad Vashem, uh, one of the uh, many uh, expressions of gratitude uh, from uh, Jewish partners. Uh, he, Julius Schanger, mentions immediately Rosenstrasse and down toward the end he said no one can deny your role no one can deny your role that's what we're trying to uh, make sure no one does uh, that we keep remembering the role that these that these women played in rescuing thousands of Jews next slide well here are the books that uh, my friend Mordecai mentioned Resistance of the Heart is one that I uh, published in 1996. And we have uh, now the future book, Women Defying Hitler, Rescue and Resistance Under the Nazis that's coming out in, in several months. And let me introduce uh, Ruth Wiseman, who I've been very pleased to get to know. I met her mother, Rita Kuhn, as a, uh, an eyewitness of somebody who was imprisoned at the Rosenstrasse and uh, uh, Ruth has been a backbone of our efforts to educate people about this, a wonderful uh, collaborator, uh, helped us found the rosenstrassefoundation.org. I certainly hope she remains and I think she will. Uh, so we met following the publication of her mother's memoir, Broken Glass and Mordecai has been very key in bringing us together and working together. She's an independent scholar, author of a book, How the Moon Became Dim, and the forthcoming book, a children's book on the Rosenstrasse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. Appreciate that introduction. And thank you everyone for being here. Before I get started, I just wanna acknowledge that my mother is in the audience with us as are my two sisters, Rachel and Sarah. And um, so we are all present and I will be the one speaking on behalf of my family, on behalf of my mother. Uh, Matt, I'm ready for the first slide, please. This is a brief story about Rosenstrasse in retrospect, um, from the point of view of second generation, that would be me, daughter of Rita Kuhn. Next slide, please. My grandmother, Frida, was born to a lower class Lutheran family in Berlin. She converted to Judaism in the mid-1920s during a time of 
rising anti-Semitism and socioeconomic upheaval. Next slide. My grandfather, Fritz, as he liked to be called, uh, was born into a very well-established, long-standing Jewish banking family in Berlin. We can trace the roots back into the 1700s when one of my great-great-great-grandfathers was a shoichet, a ritual slaughter in the Jewish community. His family was initially opposed to their union, Fritz and Frida's, due to the fact that she was from a Lutheran background and a lower class background, but they were deeply in love and their engagement photo, I think, reflects that. And um, this is a tribute to them. Next slide, please. My mother Rita was their first child. She was born November 29th, 1927. Her brother was born in 1931. He still lives right outside of Berlin. They are all pictured on the left and my mother is on the right with her Schultoite, which is basically a cone filled with candy and school supplies for children's first day of school in Germany. And this would have been in 1934. Next slide. Just um, about 20 days prior to my mother's 11th birthday on November 9th, 1938, her beloved synagogue, Pazan Stasa, was attacked and reduced to rubble and broken glass. She had been on her way there for school and she started to call out to the passersby, our synagogue is burning, our synagogue is burning. And they turned away, shamefaced. Next slide, please. She was, um, she wore the yellow star. She was uh, drafted into forced labor in approximately 1941. And it was a munitions factory similar to the one we see here, which is not the one necessarily that she was in. She worked about 12 hour, 11, 12 hour days, the beginning crack of dawn until after the sunset. Next slide. At 7 a.m. on February 27, 1943, she had just sat down to her place at work and she was getting ready to start her day when the factory was filled with assessment and they started shouting, Juden in the Raus, Jews out. She looked up, she saw her Jewish compatriots slowly making way, their way to the front of the factory and she joined them. They were taken on trucks to the Clue Dance Hall and she was detained there overnight. When she was released the next day, for reasons still unknown to us, she arrived home and her father nearly collapsed from seeing her because she was home and because it had not been the Gestapo knocking at the door. They were not called back to work for an entire week, she and her father, and they were filled with a sense of foreboding. I just wanna very quickly point out um, that my mother was born of a German Gentile woman who had converted to Judaism and to her Jewish father. She was considered a Jew on her school records. The top left card on the fourth line sh shows her religion as Jewish. The one below it in 1941 shows her religion as Jewish. Then the slide um, in the upper right, her religion is changed to Evangelisch, which means Protestant, and it shows a conversion date of December 7th, 1941. Her parents, on the hope that they could spare her from deportation, had her baptized on that day, which was also Pearl Harbor, coincidentally, but she um, was still made to wear the yellow star. And on the reverse of that card is the breakdown of her parents and her grandparents and, uh, and her identity, which is Kind Yuda. Child is Jewish. Next slide, please. 
Rosenstrasse, March 5th, 1943. As my mother writes in her memoir, on March 5th, my mother went to pick, out, pick up our rations cards at a school nearby. She returned soon after. Something in her demeanor held us locked in fear. They wouldn't give them to me. You have to go get them yourselves, she said with her eyes averted. That's it, my father said, his voice clear and steady. Put on some extra layers of clothes. There was no need for an explanation. At the school, my mother made ready to join us as we followed the assessment, taking us into a separate room. But he brushed her away with a brusque, nine, not you. Her face turned ashen and rigid. We were taken together into a, a room at the school. And my father said, I guess they realized they made a mistake when they released us a week ago. Poor mama. There are more Jews who were brought in. We sat, all of us, in our own silence. Suddenly, a woman's voice started, startled us. Let me see my children. You cannot take my children from me. Let me go with my children. We could not identify the voice until my father turned to Hans, Hans and me and said loud enough for others to hear, das ist doch unsere Mama. This is our mama. Her voice, usually so low and gentle, never raised in anger, was stretched beyond recognition that it rose above any care for herself as she faced fully armed SS men. Next slide, please. We were taken to Rosenstrasse 2-4, an abandoned building. Men and women were separated. I was in a room with a woman named Miriam Jurgens. Miriam had been waiting for the decision all week since she had been taken from her factory on September, February 27th. Everyone, she told me, was living in some form of a mixed marriage. The Gestapo had not yet decided what to do with the different cases. Some had been deported already. She then related a most incredible incident that had been occurring all week. From the first day of the citywide roundups, there had been a demonstration, a protest, really, by the Gentile wives and mothers of their Jewish husbands and children interned in Rosenstrasse. They demanded the release of their family members. It started with a small number, but soon swelled to a chorus of a few hundred desperate women shouting, give us back our men, give us back our men. Miriam heard the cries through the only window in our room. There were moments when the SS was able to disperse them, but hours later, the women would continue in increasing numbers. As a result of this protest, many prisoners had been released while others were deported. My mother ends there. Well, I'm gonna end her quote there and continue in my own voice. She and her father, her, she and her brother, my, my mother and Hans were detained overnight. They were sent home on March 6 and were told that their father would come home shortly. Thankfully, Opa Fritz was released and came home. He and Rita were assigned to forced labor until the end of the war. My mother on a railroad cleaning the exteriors of the trains that came from the east. Everyone held their breath, expecting another action until the Russians liberated Berlin. There's so much more to say and so much more to know, but I just really wanna thank everyone for being here today to hear this amazing story. Uh, my mother has written her memoirs and she has also written a novel based on the love between her parents. She wrote a, a uh, historical fiction based on their courtship and the, the ominous times in which they married. Thank you again. Um, I'm going to, I think now we're gonna have another clip from the movie Rosenstrasse. Entschuldigen Sie, man sagte uns, dass unsere Männer von hier weggebracht würden. Das ist wohl so beschlossen worden. Wohin denn? Ich weiß nicht. Ich würde so gern meinen Mann noch einmal sehen. Das kann ich verstehen. Aber es ist ja nun mal unmöglich. Ich könnte doch nachts, wenn Sie allein Dienst haben. Das würde mich den Kragen kosten, Frau Fischer. 
Und ihn auch. Aber vielleicht hinten. Im Hinterhof, da sieht mich doch keiner. Ich will meinen Mann zurück. Gebt uns unsere Männer wieder. Wir wollen unsere Männer wieder haben. Ich will meinen Mann zurück. Ich will meinen Mann zurück haben. Ich will meinen Mann zurück haben. Da hören Sie es, die wollen alle zu ihren Männern. you back uh, to two dates, uh, 1935 and 1942. In 1935, we have what is called the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, this was the Nazi determination to decide who is a Jew and who is not a Jew. Uh, it was very important to them because the Nazis and Hitler especially considered Jews as uh, disease carriers, as blood soilers. So they had to be separated from, from the so-called Aryans, the German people. But this has to be done based on a racial definition. But uh, to the Nazi, this meant on the blood in one's veins, something that was immutable, unchangeable, and passed on from generation to generation. So according to the Nuremberg laws, a full a Jew, what they call the full Jude, is anyone with at least three Jewish grandparents. But anyone who had only two Jewish grandparents, or only one, then they invented a new category called Mischling. Mischling means uh, mixed, hybrid, mongrel, half-breed. We're talking about a phenomenon. There were hundreds of thousands. According to one study, there were up to 500,000. Maybe it's an exaggeration. But there were uh, people who were the offspring of intermarriage. and. Uh, Category A was if you have only two Jewish grandparents and two Aryan grandparents. And uh, so you, are, you have half good blood, half bad blood. Category B, if you only have one Jewish grandparent, so you're only one quarter Jew, so you're in a better situation. And then there was another different category, and that is called gelting Jude. This means an Aryan who of his own free will had converted to Judaism like uh, uh, Rita Kuhn's uh, mother. And the Nazis and the German Nazis had even a greater contempt for, for such people because here you are, you are an Aryan, 100% Aryan, and you converted to Judaism. Uh, so these were, uh, no, the laws pertaining to, uh, between Jews and non-Jews was no sexual relations, sexual relations, uh, beyond marriage was forbidden. It was Rassenschande. It was considered blood pollution, contamination. And this was the law in 1935. At the same time, people who were already married could stay married. So this is like a, a contradiction. But then I'm gonna take you to the Wednesday conference on January 20th, 1942. Uh, this conference was called by the Nazi leadership to coordinate the, what they call the final solution of the Jewish question. In other words, the extermination of the Jews all across Europe. Uh, now, the stenographer took the notes. 
uh, it was then typed up and it fell into the hands of the Allies uh, upon liberation. So we have the document of what was discussed. Very surprisingly, half of the time was taken up with what to do with the Mischlinger and what to do what they called Mischehe. In other words, persons who were intermarried, who had intermarried, Jewish spouses with non-Jewish spouses. Uh, so uh, they debated that. And you can read that. If you go online, you read about the Wednesday conference, you can read uh, the full text uh, of the, this conference. Uh, by high-ranking uh, Nazis, many of them, interestingly, with PhD degrees. Uh, so mixed marriages, here again, it's uh, divided between, uh, between uh, where the husband is, is an Aryan, so-called Aryan, or where the husband is a Jew. Where the husband is an Aryan and the wife is Jewish, that's not so terrible to the Nazis because uh, he was inseminating her with Aryan blood. So he, she, uh, nothing was happening to him. But where the husband was Jewish and the wife was Aryan, then he, he is the culprit. And, uh, but even in those cases, if they had children, then they were categorized as privilege, privilegierte. Uh, so what was the solution? What was to be done with these Mischlinger? who counted in the tens of thousands. Nobody has the exact uh, statistics because a lot of these people who were Michelin, they didn't identify themselves, but they numbered in the tens of thousands, some say 150,000. Now, at the Wanzi conference, there were the, the two possible uh, options that were, uh, that were provided. One was sterilization. In other words, they said a person who's a Michelin and wants to stay alive, doesn't want to be deported, he has to agree to be sterilized. So he's not going to produce any children. And that will be the end of the story for the next generation. If he doesn't want to be sterilized, board the train and uh, get deported. Another possibility, another idea, uh, which was brought forward by a man, uh, Wilhelm Stuckart from the uh, Interior Ministry, is to abolish marriage, to declare all marriages between Jews and non-Jews are hereby abolished. This was not accepted for many reasons. Uh, one reason is uh, some, many of these marriages were consecrated in the church. And uh, so you cannot abolish that because you're gonna in trouble with the, with the church, with the Catholic church. Now to give you an idea of the scope of the problem from the Nazis perspective, uh, then we have the following. Uh, we have, for instance, in 1939, there were still 331,000 Jews in Germany in 1939, 331,000. Uh, that includes Germany, Austria, and the Sudetenland. And in 1939, there were about 86,000 Mischlinger, grade A and grade B. Uh, and uh, the, other, the other category I have to mention is Jews who had converted to Christianity, what the Nazis uh, called Taufjude. Uh, now there were about 138,000 by, by Nazi calculation. About 50,000 had left uh, in 1933. And the German churches were struggling what to do with Jews who by to all intents and purposes, they were Christians, but they had Jewish blood. Some of them were 100% Jewish. In other words, they had four Jewish grandparents. And so this is known as the Aryan clause. And there were people like Bonhoeffer, Niemöller, who claimed uh, that uh, while we're not getting, inv getting involved with what's happening to the Jews, but Jews who had converted and they were baptized, then uh, we should uh, take care. We should take care for them, and we should admit it in the churches, and uh, we should do the best that we can because they are Christians. And so this is the story of what is called the Confessing Church. We're not going to go into this, but I just want to mention that as late as 1940, as late as 1940 with Germany at war and Poland had been conquered. And in 1940, the German army moved west and they invaded France, Holland and Belgium. In 1940, there were 25,000 soldiers who were Mischling or they were Mischehe. In other words, the husband was married to a Jew. Uh, he was not Jewish and he was in the army. It went so far that Hitler insisted 
that all these soldiers with Jewish blood or people who were married to Jews, they should be discharged from the army. This is 1940. And by 1942, there were still some, some of these uh, people in the German army. Uh, very interesting. People who were category B, Michelin, and they appealed uh, to be upgraded to category A. In other words, there were a quarter, uh, in other words, people who were, I'm sorry, category A and wanted to be upgraded to category B. In other words, only one quarter, only one quarter Jewish, not half Jewish, or from category B, one quarter Jewish to full Aryan, Hitler left the decision to himself. And up to 1942, out of 9,600 requests, he approved 263 such requests to be upgraded. But then by 1942, Hitler made a decision, no more requests like that to be put on my desk until the end of the war. So this is the story of Jews married to non-Jews, Mischling and uh, the nicht uh, Christen, in other words, baptized Jews. Uh, incidentally, baptized Jews, uh, they did not benefit from any lenience. All baptized Jews who were considered full youth, in other words, they had four Jewish grandparents, they were all deported. They went to Auschwitz and they went to other places and they were exterminated. So this is the only category of people that uh, uh, the Nazis uh, did not show any le lenience. Okay. So uh, getting back to the Rosenstrasse story, the significance of this story is here is a group of women uh, that succeeded in forcing Hitler's hand, but they didn't know it at the beginning when they went out on the street and protested, they had no idea. And they protested on what? On an issue which went to the heart of the Nazi ideology which is much emphasized and stressed in Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, that he wrote in 1924, of the purity of Aryan blood from contamination of Jewish blood, which these women married to Jewish men were withstanding the pressure to divorce their Jewish husbands and were violating this, this uh, Nazi principle day after day. In addition, this is a protest in full public view against armed men lasting for a whole week. One week after the infamous Goebbels total war speech. It takes much courage, we have to admit. And these totally defenseless women without any social backing took up the challenge and succeeded. Now, of course, historians are debating some of the possible reasons why Hitler and Goebbels gave in. One of them may have, uh, may have been uh, the recent uh, terrible military debacle of the German army in the Battle of Stalingrad, where a whole German army, counting 300,000 men, were lost. Uh, and uh, which were also, at that time, uh, Berlin was subjected to intense bombing by Allied planes, British and American. And so there was a morale. The morale of the German people uh, was beginning to fall apart. And maybe, and then you have the Rosenstrasse protest right there at that particular time. Uh, so that may have prompted Hitler, uh, who was very sensitive to public opinion. Yes, very strangely, although he was a full dictator, but he was sensitive to public opinion inside Germany. That may have prompted him to liberate the husbands, as I said at the beginning, who some of them were already in Auschwitz, and not because out of compassion, but to liberate him now for tactical reasons and then to arrest him at a later, later period. At the same time, these women who stood out in the street and protested for a full week, they could not have known beforehand the outcome of their challenge to the Nazi regime. They could have all been arrested, if not shot outright today on the street, but it certainly arrested and carried off to some concentration camp or labor camp or something worse. They didn't know it and they succeeded. We therefore have every right 
to celebrate their courage and use them as role models for opposition to tyrannical regimes. And they proved it can be done and it can succeed. Thank you, Dr. Paldiel. So there are a lot of questions accumulating in the chat box. Let's get to some of those now. Then I will tell you a little bit about upcoming programs. Then we will have final thoughts from our speakers. So one question that I see rephrased in different ways is, uh, were there other similar actions that happened elsewhere or was this an isolated story? Nathan, it's for you. Well, this, this is an isolated story, partly because of how the action was carried out. All of these uh, husbands of uh, non-Jewish uh, wives collected at one place. And of course it was in Berlin where half of the intermarried Jews lived. So that uh, was, was a one-time event, uh, but uh, it it's really stands on its own. Yes, it's alone. So were there any men in the protest or only women? Well, the, 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 the point is that women initiated the protest. They were the spirit of the protest, men joined in, it's true. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, men were not on the edge of the knife as Mordecai was uh, saying, men with, with Jewish uh, women as their partners, these Jewish women did not have to wear the star, uh, but with these uh, Jewish households where the, uh, the Jewish partner was the male, they even had the Jewish star by their doorways. So uh, the, the, these, uh, these women were, were on the edge of the knife. So were any of these people later deported or were they free? Uh, there were one or two that I've heard about who went to Theresienstadt, although they survived. And uh, I don't know of any, any single one who did not survive. There were no more... Uh, uh, systematic uh, deportations of intermarried Jews from the uh, f from the Old Reich. Okay. Well, although I must add to what Nathan said that when it comes to the Mischlinger, grade A, in other words, half Jewish and half Aryans, many of them later on in 1944 were sent to Theresienstadt. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Aryan, I use the word Aryan, excuse me, you know, it's a Nazi definition, non-Jewish husbands of Jews, uh, later on, towards the end of uh, the Third Reich in late 1944, they were drafted for performing labor in, for example, the Tote Organization, which was building fortifications. So uh, they were always uh, on the edge, uh, and they had to worry that there, there could be a switch of Nazi policy uh, in their disfavor. Oh, absolutely. It could have changed at any moment. And that's the uncertainty I was talking about. Uh, Ohlendorf, who uh, actually led one of these Einsatzgruppen who shot masses and masses of Germans, was actually, according to his testimony after the war at Nuremberg trial, he was ordered in October 1944 to go around house to house where these intermarried couples lived and to shoot the Jewish partner. Uh, but he refused uh, to do that. Uh, seeing which way the winds were blowing, no doubt. Now, there's a question about how German historians regard this event. So is it well known in Germany? Uh, well, uh, it's not, uh, it, it has been uh, not really commemorated. It's not in the uh, school curriculum texts. Uh, I think uh, it, it has been rather, uh, I think the, uh, that the Germans do not know how to deal with it because the common wisdom there is that uh, anybody who tried to resist was immediately crushed by the Gestapo. Now that's certainly not wrong. It's just that uh, here we have an incident, uh, a very important event where that was not the case. So right now I'm gonna tell you just briefly about upcoming programs and then we'll get to final thoughts from our speakers. So uh, next week we are showing a film and having a discussion about a Holocaust survivor from Hungary whose name you all know, and that is George Soros.
So there's a film that was made about Soros by Jesse Dillon, who is the son of the musician Bob Dylan. So we're going to have Jesse Dillon on the panel, as well as the producer Priscilla Cohen and Michael Berenbaum, co-founder of the U.S. Holocaust Museum. So right now we're just going to see a, a little trailer for that film. What's it like to have a lot of money? It gives you a degree of freedom. And it also gives you a degree of power. Most Americans have no idea who George Soros is. What a demon. He is one of the most feared men in the world. A Nazi collaborator, literally. Spawn of Satan. We all need to wake up. One of those evil people in the world. There is this gap between perception and reality. He was 13 years old when the Nazis came to Budapest. We became targets during the crescendo of the Holocaust. 400,000 killed in a matter of weeks. That shaped my life. Instead of giving in, actually trying to prevail. I chose the West because I sought freedom and to make money. He made more than anybody else on Wall Street. The act of making money made him miserable. I asked myself, why am I doing it? I did have fantasies of saving the world. The philanthropy started gradually. Communism. Gay rights. Education. The more issues he became involved with, the more enemies he began to make. He's become demonized because he's synonymous with liberal cause. I have taken controversial positions to try to make the world a better place. It's a battle of ideas at the most fundamental level. We need each person. There is a conscience that they need to activate. Financial markets always move forward, and the same is true of history. We need people to understand the power they have within them. George always feels an individual can make a difference. I'm willing to stake my life on that. So after today's program, you will receive an email with information about signing up for our future programs. Uh, this program and the three programs beyond that are open for registration. Uh, today's program is free, as many of our programs are, but next week uh, there is a cost. We do suggest $18 or high, and our paid programs uh, serve to uh, finance our free programs over the rest of the month, so uh, we hope that you will respect that, but you are welcome to pay whatever is comfortable for you. So uh, now we turn back to today's speakers for their final thoughts, starting with you, Dr. Nathan Stoltzfus. Oh, thank you. I was just about to say that uh, here's a history that shows that individuals can make a difference. And that was, of course, what uh, George Soros underlined. We studied the past to enlighten the present. And here's a story that shows that uh, we each have a responsibility to try. Uh, Mordecai just underlined that it actually worked in this case <clears throat> of these women. Uh, it certainly, as uh, Vaclav Havel wrote, uh, we must attempt to live in the truth. We, we attempt that uh, great calling. Uh, these uh, women protesters actually managed to communicate with the Gestapo. That's something really rare among resistors as well, because all other resistance was, uh, most other resistance was conspiratorial, where you popped up and tried to blow, blow up <clears throat> blow up Hitler, or maybe just stay below and try to change opinion. And, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, Ruth's mother, Rita Kuhn, testified that when she was taken into custody at Rosenstrasse, a Gestapo officer said, your relatives are out there pro protesting for you. That's German loyalty for you. And so, uh, you know, they changed, they communicated, they made an impression. And uh, I think uh, we call on this story to be included in German school text. Why has it been overlooked? Also in memorials and commemorations in Germany, it's an important story for children, for youth, and uh, that anyone can make a difference and we should all try. Ruth, what would you like to say? Well, thank you, Nathan. That's a wonderful segue. Uh, my mother spoke for decades in schools 
precisely for that reason to tell, tell children that their voice matters, that when you see injustice, stand up to it and that your voice matters. And it's a very powerful legacy for me to also carry on and share with my own children, my two daughters, and to recognize that even if you feel powerless, you still have power and to believe that. And my mom is uh, downstairs with my two daughters. They might pop in <laughs> for a second. I don't know if you can unmute for a second. There's- um, Here, Oma, can you say hi? There we go. Moti, would you like to say a little hello? hello? And say hello. What? You can say hello. Hello. I am so frank that the that, is, that has been given because we need to understand and to be our yeah. own felt. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to hear our story today. And everyone yeah. else is too. Yes, thank you. Mordechai, why don't you give us your final thoughts? My final thoughts, well, History is filled with a lot of events. Most of the events we don't remember. They are forgotten. And they don't remain in our memory. We don't commemorate them. Well, you know, for us Jews, every year we celebrate Passover. An event that happened over 3000 years ago, freedom from slavery. The Bible, doesn't stop from repeating. Do not cause pain to the stranger. Do not harass the stranger because you yourself were strangers and slaves in Egypt. That appears in so many places in the Bible. And so we remember Passover, which is one event among many events because of the significance of the event. And now we have another event, the Rosenstrasse protest. How are we going to commemorate that? We have to commemorate that. Now, I worked at Yad Vashem for 24 years, and I was involved in honoring non-Jews who saved Jews. Uh, Yad Vashem has uh, established certain criteria. Uh, one of the criteria is we're talking non-Jews who saved Jews, uh, persons to, uh, that they were not involved in any marital relationship. When it comes to uh, the story of a Jewish uh, uh, man uh, that is saved by his non-Jewish wife or uh, contrary wives, uh, Yad Vashem would not honor these, uh, the, the rescuer on the, uh, uh, on the argument that uh, a husband that saves his wife or a wife that saves a husband, that's uh, a natural obligation. Uh, and so we did not honor, we do not honor people who saved their spouses when one side is Jewish and the other side is non-Jewish. However, however, there are exceptional and unique stories that stand out and that cry to heaven. And one of these stories is the Rosenstrasse protest. I mean, these are people who challenged the Nazi regime. We have to understand challenging openly, openly challenging, not secretly. Uh, and I think that this this should, this should be uh, made into an educational tool at Yad Vashem and in schools uh, to teach the young generation that it's possible to stand out, to challenge, to resist, based on the example of the Rosenstrasse uh, women. And uh, so I think that even at Yad Vashem, uh, something can be done at Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem has a whole department, an educational department. Thousands of students are brought in every year to teach them about the Holocaust and teach them about the righteous Gentiles. And I think there is room also to show them the example of these Rosenstrasse women protesters. Uh, uh, whether these uh, women are going to be honored individually by name or not, but the story has to be told. And in addition, I hope that one day, very soon, there'll be some kind of a commemorative monument, monument in Israel, just like there was one in Berlin, uh, someplace in Israel where students 
uh, children and Israelis of all ranks and uh, files can be brought and in front of this monument, they can be shown, they can be told the story of these Rosenstrasse women. So that the story of the Rosenstrasse protested does not get buried in history. It's an event which has as much significance, at least in my opinion, as the event of the exodus from Egypt. Wow, what a comparison. <laughs> so on this Valentine's Day, let me thank you all from the bottom of my heart. I do hope you'll join us next week and in weeks to come. Thank you to our speakers and to our audience and see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>